right, so just as a real quick refresher as to where we were last time, um, we had talked a little bit about what continuity was. We encountered this definition about continuity, and then we got to this point where we did this remark that actually sort of parsed out what the definition was telling us. It was telling us three things. The function value exists, the limit value exists, and those two pieces of information are the same. Okay? So we're on to this slide, I believe. Does that look right to you guys? All right. So on this slide, we're actually asked to explain why the function fails to be continuous at the value and which of the conditions are not met. So what's going to go on in this function that causes this to be discontinuous at x equal 1? It'll give me a 0 in the denominator, which means one of two things is happening. So when I get a 0 in the denominator, what are the one of two possibilities that are happening? Asymptote, Asymptote or whole. Do you know what this one is? Can you tell? This one's an asymptote, actually. And we're going to talk more about it in 1.5, how, how you decide which one it is. But this one actually has an asymptote there. All right, so if you take a look over here, which pieces of this remark fail in this particular situation? Can you tell? So the function's not defined. So number one fails, right? So f of 1 is not defined, or you could say it doesn't exist. Right? Because I can't plug 1 in. That's exactly the problem. How about the second point? Is the limit going to exist? It's actually not either going to exist. So the limit does not exist. And the reason is because there's, there's an asymptote. And let me just part, let me just say it right now, actually, and we'll get into more detail about this later. But the reason there's an asymptote is because you only get a hole in the graph when the numerator and the denominator are reducible, and we cancel a factor out. So this one doesn't have that feature, right? I can't factor the numerator and factor the denominator and remove that x minus 1. So that's why there's not a hole in the graph. So that must be, by default, there's an asymptote. Um, so 3 automatically fails, right? Because I can't even talk about it in a way that makes any sense. Right? I mean, the limit and the value have to be the same thing. Well, the limit doesn't exist and the value doesn't exist, so that doesn't even make any sense to talk about it this way. So this one is sort of irrelevant or not applicable, if you would like. So this fails to be continuous at x equal 1 because x equals 1, let me use what Blaine said, it makes the denominator equal to 0. That's actually why it fails to be continuous. And then what really happens there is an asymptote. Is that okay? Now notice, if this actually had been reducible, if I could have simplified this, f, f of 1 still wouldn't be defined, okay? But the second one would actually have a limit. So the second piece failing would then automatically again make the third piece fail, because again they don't match. All right, theorem 4.1 and then theorem 4.2 here talk about some pieces that we've seen before in a little bit different form. It says all polynomials are continuous everywhere. Why is that true? Why are polynomials continuous everywhere? Can you look back at the page before and tell me where is it that we were finding or how is it that we were finding things that aren't continuous? What happened every time we looked at something that wasn't continuous? Examples one and two have in common. Actually, even example three. What do they all have in common? Okay. At least there's some place where the denominator equals zero, right? 
And I'm going to say even more specifically, they have denominators, don't they? What about polynomials? They don't have denominators, right? There's not the ability for them to have a denominator equals zero because they don't have denominators. So that's the biggest sort of issue of what's going on here is that polynomials are continuous everywhere because they don't have a denominator issue going on. Okay? Sine and cosine, continuous everywhere, right? Because they're, they're these nice smooth waves, right? We don't have any problems. There's no asymptotes there on sines and cosines. The nth root functions are also continuous as long as they're defined. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you take a look here, there's a couple details. It says it's continuous when n is odd everywhere, and it's continuous when n is even between when it's x is greater than 0. So let's talk about when n is odd. We talked about this last time. When n is odd, we're actually looking at something kind of like a cube root, right? And can I take a cube root of a negative number? Careful. Cube root, I can. So let me give you an example. The cube root of negative 27 is actually negative 3, because negative 3 times negative 3 times negative 3 is, 20, is negative 27. So it's perfectly fine to take a cube root of a negative number. However, if the root were even, like a square root, yeah, that's no good. That puts us into the imaginary numbers or the complex number system, and that's not what we're working with when we're working in this particular class of calculus, okay? So that's why this says x has to be greater than zero if we're dealing with an even root. All right, the last one, theorem 4.2, should feel so much like a theorem you've seen before. It's just that it's talking about continuity instead of talking about limits. It's telling you that your function, if you have individual functions that are continuous at x equals a, and you add them together, you multiply them, or you divide them, they still stay continuous. And of course, you see that caveat sort of on part three here that says, you know, as long as the denominator is not zero. So this, this should feel like that same, so almost like a corollary to that theorem that we had before about limits. It's just telling you about continuity in the same fashion. A couple more. Now, theorem 4.3 says that if we have a composed function, that is, we have f of g of x, and we want to talk about the limit. We could take the limit on the inside first and find that value and then just plug it into the outer limit. As long as f is continuous, that will work. So let me give you an example so that it looks like something you, you might recognize. Let's say we had the limit as x approaches 0 of the square root of sine x. Sine x sort of looks like it's inside of a square root, right? You've got some function inside sine x. You've got the square root on the outside. All this theorem is telling you that you can do is that you can actually do the square root after you do the limit. That's all it's saying. Again, as long as the function is defined there and that works. The other one on this slide talks about a corollary to that theorem. It says, suppose that g is continuous at a, and f is continuous in g and a, then the composition is continuous. So we can talk about continuity in the same way we talk about these limits in theorem 4.3. So if we can do this with the limits, and we can talk about continuity in the same way. So if the function inside is continuous and the function outside is continuous, then when we compose them together, we get a, con a continuous function. Right. In other words, because sine of x is continuous and because the square root function is a continuous type function, when I put them together in that way, the square root of sine x is going to be continuous too. That's what that says. <coughs> Interval continuity. Now, if you'll notice when we looked at continuity before, we looked at it at a specific point A. This is actually looking at an interval of points. This says if we have a function that's continuous, on an open interval AB, it's continuous at every point on that interval, then we say it's continuous on the interval. Similarly, if it's continuous at the two endpoints, then we can talk about keep being continuous on the closed interval. Remember those brackets mean closed interval. Finally, if it is continuous everywhere on negative infinity to infinity, 
we simply use the phrase that it is continuous. In other words, if you hear the phrase continuous with no clarification afterwards, it means it's continuous everywhere. So polynomial functions, continuous, because they're continuous everywhere. Those square root and those cube root kind of functions, they're continuous everywhere on their domain, right? So square roots are only continuous on zero to infinity, actually, because that's the only place they exist. But that's where we're using that phrase continuous. So if you see continuous listed with nothing written after it, it means continuous everywhere. All right, take a look at this function. This function is a composition function. We have a function 1 over x inside of a function cosine, right? Now, there's no parentheses drawn, but many of your calculators would actually force you to put parentheses like right here if you were actually putting this into the, into the calculator. So if you do that, you will see the inside versus the outside function like that, right? Intervals on which this is continuous. Well, cosine is continuous everywhere, right? How about 1 over x? No, it has a problem. What's its problem? Right, so it's discontinuous. at x equals 0, which means the composition of cosine with that 1 over x has that same issue with continuity. It's also not going to be continuous at x equals 0. So this is going to be then continuous where? Perfect. You guys remember that notation? We used that last time. Everywhere except for it leaves out the point 0. Any question on that one? All right, this is a little bit different, and I, I included in this because I think it's important. Um, every now and then we're going to do things that aren't directly related. Um, I don't want to say it that way. They're related to a real-life problem in a way that's really applicable to your lives or will be shortly because you all are going to pay taxes at some point in your life if you don't already, right? You've probably heard people make comments like this before. I don't want to make any more money than I'm making now because that will put me in a different tax bracket and then I'll have to owe more money. You heard phrases like that before? Okay, so I wanted to do this example to show you that that's not how things work. So when people make statements like that, I'm going to use the number 10,000 simply because this one has 10,000 in it to show you what they mean when they say that and why that's not right. What they mean when they say that is... They're assuming, let's say, for instance, that when you make $10,000, let's say you pay $2,000 in taxes. These aren't real numbers. Just pretend with me for a moment. If you did that, you would take $8,000 home, right? Okay. Well, their claim is that if you made $10,001, that would push you into a bracket that then would cost you more in taxes and would result in you taking less than $8,000 home. That's the argument they're trying to make, and that's not what the tax brackets do. Yes, you'll pay more money in taxes, but you'll still take more home more than the $8,000 you would have had you only made the $10,000, okay? So you pay more in taxes only on that additional percentage that's above or portion that's above that next value. So I'm answering the question right now for you that the, it says here, it says give a rationale for why this function should be continuous. Well, this function should be continuous for exactly why I've said. You shouldn't be able to make more money, right, and actually end up taking less money home. That'd be bad. Agreed? Yeah, that, that would be not good. That would certainly be a reason not to make more money if you thought you were going to actually end up with less money in your take-home pocket, right? Okay, so this is actually why this needs to be continuous. This needs to be continuous so that when I increase something from $10,000 to $10,001, it actually makes sense the money I get to take home still is a little bit more, even if the taxes are a little bit more too, I still take home more money. Okay. That's the rationale behind what's going on here. I need these tax functions or these tax tables or these tax um, brackets to actually make sense in terms of what I'm taking home versus what I'm paying in. All right, so let's take a look at what's going on in this particular situation. This says, suppose the state's income tax code states that the tax liability on X dollars of taxable income is given by zero if you make X is less than or equal to zero, make nothing. You get to take a, have a 14% tax, that's 0.14 times X, 
if your tax is between 0 and 10,000. And then you have this weird C plus 0.21x if your tax or if the amount you make is over 10,000. What we want is we want this function to be continuous. So remember back to theorem or to remark 4.1, it had three things that have to happen for the function to be continuous, right? What had to happen? Has to be defined. What else? The limit has to exist. And the third thing is? Right. The limit and the value at f have to be the same. What we want to be able to do in this table is we want to be able to add an equal sign to either the bottom one or the middle one. It doesn't matter which one. And we can do that. And that'll be okay and it'll work as long as the limit of my function t of x from the left and the right of 10,000 are the same. If those limits are the same, then the limit's going to exist. And the limit of exists, and if the limit exists, we can have that function value because I've put that equal sign. Any idea on how I find C in order to make this limit exist? Wouldn't it be the same? <clears throat> Which line of this display am I on if I'm approaching 10,000 from the left? The second one, right? And which line am I on if I'm approaching 10,000 from the right? The third one. So what is this telling you has to happen? The second equal to third. When? Because it doesn't have to be equal to its third all the time. When does it have to be equal to the third? At 10,000. So we're going to set the second equation at x equals to 10,000 equal to the third equation when x is equal to 10,000. You see, what I want is I want an image that while it may look like this and then it may be more steep after this, they meet up right here at this point. That's what I want to have happen. Okay? So in other words, I actually need them to be equal, but only at the point 10,000. What do you get for C if you go through and do that algebra? It is close. Negative 700, actually. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the negative. I'm sorry, Taylor. Yes, negative 700, right. All right, so again, that's not a, a, a tax amount. That's not what this is. It's part of the function that will make this continuous. So that goes in place of the C right here. Does everybody understand how we did that and why that worked? Let me reiterate one more time it's something I said, but I didn't say it very clearly, I don't think. This give a rationale business, I didn't write it down because I don't have enough space on my screen to write it down. I told you what I would have written down, though, right? The words that I was saying is what I would have written down if I were working this particular problem. So when you have one like this and you're, you're going to have an example like this in your homework, when it says give a rationale, it means you're going to write it down because you're going to have space on your paper, okay? All right. Last thing in this section is the intermediate value theorem. <coughs> There's a little bit of notation here I'm going to have to clarify for you. And I'm going to draw a picture to show you what's going on, too. First of all, it says we have a continuous function on a closed interval. Okay, so it's continuous means there's no holes, no asymptotes, no jumps. Right? It's continuous. And the closed interval starts at A, and it ends at B. And it can look like anything you want in between there. say it looks like that. Actually, it'll be easier for me to draw it if I draw it like this. Because my screen's abbreviated. 
Okay, so then the points that I marked in red are f of a and f of b. This is saying if w is a number between f of a and f of b, so let's say w is right here. Then if I go along over here appropriately, I will hit a point on the graph. Okay, let me try this one more time. I need to move it down so I can see it better. There will be a location on the graph, oh goodness, such that the x value that happens at that spot, which we'll call c, is between a and b. This notation right here means is an element of. It just means it's between it for an interval. Okay, So c is between a and b. And the reason that we can say that's for sure going to happen is because this is continuous. There aren't any holes or gaps or asymptotes. I don't have any places where I've got weird behavior going on. It's nice and continuous. Now, an application or a corollary to that is the idea that let's say that that A value and that B value, we have it continuous again on the interval AB. F of A and F of B now have opposite signs. That is, one's positive and one's negative. So in terms of a picture, you've actually got something going on like this. Here's A and here's B. So F of A is down here and it's negative. F of B is up here and it's positive. This corollary says there has to be a value between a and b where the function value equals zero. That means where it crosses the x-axis. There's no way I can't cross the x-axis if I have to go from being negative to positive or positive to negative. I can't just jump over it. I actually have to hit the x-axis at some point. Does that make sense? I'm going to give you an um, example of where this is used in real life, and I mean real, real life not a word problem that looks like an equation in real life, okay? But real, real life. We're going to do a problem with the, um, the equation first, though. All right, so take a look at this example, last one in this particular section. Use the intermediate value theorem to verify that f of x has a zero on the given interval. So it says f of x is x squared minus 7. This is on the interval 2 to 3. So the first thing that makes this corollary and this intermediate value theorem work is what's boxed in f has to be continuous. Why is it that we know that this function is continuous? There's no denominator. Somebody else said something specific. It's a polynomial. So I'm going to use the phrase it's a polynomial simply because it encompasses all that idea and more. And we actually had a theorem that says if you have a polynomial, it's continuous, which is really nice. So this is continuous. Everywhere, you could just say continuous would be fine, too. Because it's a polynomial. What is the next condition? Well, if I'm wanting to try and figure out that it has a zero, it's actually referring me back to this corollary. So I've got the continuous. What else do I have to have? <coughs> Well, the zero is going to fall between A and B. Well, you know that one has to be negative, one has to be positive. One what, Andy? Of A or B. Not A and B. Functions. The function values at A and B. So what I need is I need to show that F of 2 and F of 3, right, the function values at those X values, one of them is positive and one of them is negative. So what is F of 2? And what is f of 3? Yeah, and there's nothing special about why those sort of look like they changed values. But that's not what's really happening. The point is one's positive, one's negative, right? Okay. So because f of 2 is less than 0 and 0 is less than f of 3, 
right? One of them is positive, one of them is negative. There will be a C value between two, let me say it this way, between x equals two and x equals three, where f of c will equal the zero. That is, it will equal the zero between them. There has to be a location where it crosses the x-axis. That's what this says. And you can write that too if you want to. You don't have to write the same language I wrote down here on the bottom. You can describe it from a visual perspective. That'd be okay. I wrote it more from a sort of an abstract perspective. But you could describe it visually. Because one value is above the x-axis and the other value, y value, excuse me, right, is below the x-axis. Somewhere it had to cross the x-axis. Let me give you an example, a verbal example, of where this is used in real life. All right, so um, you guys have all experienced the point in your driving history where you see a cop and you slow down, correct? And you laugh. I know you have. All right, so here's the deal. The cops don't actually have to catch you going over the speed limit to know sometimes that you've been going over the speed limit. Here's how they can do that. And this, this, is, this happens for real. So this is your disclaimer to be on your best behavior when you drop. If there are two police officers set up at a certain distance apart, and they can choose how far it is because it's just mathematics, but let's say they're a mile apart, okay? And they can figure out how long it took you between the time you passed officer number one and officer number two. They can figure out your average speed, right? It's just miles per hour. You went one mile, and it took you how many minutes turned into hours. They can figure out your average <coughs> speed. So if the speed limit is 60, and they figure out that your average speed was 67, then they know that for sure, at some point, you were actually going 67. And the reality is, you probably were going faster. Because when you saw the first police officer, you slowed down. And when you saw the second one, you slowed down as well. Right? So they can figure that out, and they can actually use that, and that will stand in a court of law, and you will be charged, no matter the fact that they didn't actually visually 